right now um, we are conducting a planned aerial ignition. The intention is to basically walk fire into fire um, and create the best natural containment that we can. How does this fire compare to what you've seen in the past? It's different. We've got communities on either side, um, so the quickest we can we can put our style of containment on it. That there is just going to put up like the darkest, most dirtiest, nastiest smoke you can ever think of. Fires like this one have threatened lives and homes here in Canada, and have covered millions of people across North America in smoke, bringing the impacts of historic wildfires far beyond the forests where they burn. Every other year, you hear the word unprecedented, record-breaking, unheard of. In a lot of ways, breaking the record has become the standard. Exactly. The planet's rising temperature has created the perfect conditions for longer, more severe fire seasons and heat waves. The extreme heat is a silent killer. Health authorities say 112 heat-related deaths have been recorded since March. But with governments failing to cut their carbon emissions, some experts are turning to a controversial technology as a shortcut to cool the earth. Climate engineering seems to attract strong opinions. As people become more frightened, they may be more willing to take risks. Developing countries, who's going to look out for them when some nations decide to do it? So will drastic times for our climate lead to drastic measures? The stuff that we're doing is real. We're out here, we're collecting actual data points. It's not something that's theoretical. It's not something that we drew up in a model in a lab. We actually flew through the clouds. We flew over pollution. We, we collected actual data. The main objective of what we're doing is so that we can collect this data in order to inform policymakers that are gonna make changes that will help the planet. Is it fair to say this is the largest flying laboratory in the world? I believe it is, yeah. This is NASA's DC-8 research vessel. With dozens of scientists on board, its flights over oceans in major cities will collect air samples that help reveal how our climate works and what we could do to protect it. In a rare opportunity, NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, have granted us a chance to accompany them on one of these flights. Drew Rollins is a research chemist at NOAA's Chemical Sciences Laboratory. He's the marine science lead on this flight. This flight is part of NOAA's efforts to study particles in our atmosphere, an area of research that's growing quickly as the White House weighs experimental technologies that could help cool the planet. I mean, we're basically trying to just sample this region for about an hour or so, so we can observe the chemistry, chemical evolution. Like seen. I mean, I know we've seen a wide range of aerosol particle sizes, and um, lots of different aerosol compositions. We've definitely seen a bunch of sulfate. This effort to understand the impact of particles in our skies will help the U.S. federal government tackle both pollution and climate change. What I can imagine is that we sort of refine the chemistry and microphysics associated with marine emissions and cloud formation, and then incorporate it into global models that are used to sort of predict global clouds and aerosols. But hopefully we'll discover some relevant information that is useful for climate models. Now we're descending out of 1,600 feet. The 
U.S. is one of several nations investing research into the use of particles in our atmosphere for something called solar geoengineering. The amount of solar energy that so what is it exactly? One way this could be done would be to put aerosols in the upper atmosphere. These are fine. We asked Professor David Keith, a leading expert who hopes to advance the science around this climate technology. Solar geoengineering is the idea that humans might deliberately alter the Earth's radiative balance, balance between sunlight that comes in and infrared heat that radiates outward, that balance that creates the climate. They might deliberately do that to cool the planet and to reduce, say, extreme storms. Keith and other researchers believe this could be done by making clouds or oceans more reflective of the sun's rays. But the method that gets the most attention is called stratospheric aerosol injection. That's the part of the atmosphere maybe twice as high as a regular aircraft flies, where particles last for a couple of years. You could put those particles there where they would just scatter a little bit, maybe 1% of sunlight back to space. That's the thing we studied by far the most, the thing that we're most confident in some crude way would work. Some really big volcanoes are able to put a lot of sulfuric acid into the stratosphere, where it then forms really fine particles that will reflect away some sunlight and cool the planet. And in some cases, this can be quite dramatic. It can cool the planet a lot. This happens maybe a couple times a century in a way that we could measure. This could be just the beginning, according to the experts, but everyone who witnessed the eruption of Mount Pinatubo say they've seen enough. In 1991, this volcanic eruption in the Philippines sent enough particles into the atmosphere to actually cool the Earth's temperature by about half a degree Celsius, which is a big deal when considering the globe's climate goals. The idea of doing this at a global scale, distributing aerosols by plane, would cost billions of dollars. But experts, including David Keith, say it could end up saving much more money, and more importantly, us humans. This technology could be used to save a lot of lives. So with the onslaught of wildfires and heat waves, why hasn't the world already embraced solar geoengineering? There's one big issue. The technology is still untested at a large scale. And even as advocates encourage much more research before we start pumping sunblock into the atmosphere. And while it could help heal our climate, it also opens the door to rogue experiments international conflict, and concern over the side effects of an unprecedented worldwide experiment. Just ahead on In Real Life, we see the dire stakes in cross-border controversy around solar geoengineering. I do think that we need to know what could happen. Mexico is one of the countries most impacted by the world's worsening heat waves. The immediate forecast for many Mexicans is finding any way they can to beat the heat. As temperatures rose to close to 122 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer of 2023, more than 100 people died in the span of just two weeks. Most of those deaths came in the region around Monterey, just a three-hour drive from the U.S. border. Surrounded by desert, deeply divided between rich and poor, and lacking reliable water access in many communities, Monterey is on the front lines of deadly heat waves here in Mexico. I'm teaching in Guadalajara, and some professors teaching in, in, here in Monterey. And we're going to be all of the, the three groups working here in this area. In terms of uh, focusing on climate change, water, and Particularly, my group is going to be focusing on public space and housing. And so Sorella Segu served as Monterey's first chief heat officer, a role many cities across the world have introduced in recent years to spearhead efforts protecting their people from the heat. Segu often focuses on neighborhoods like this, with no running water, and like 90% of the people living in the world's hottest regions, no air conditioning. Just how severe have heat waves become in Mexico in recent years? It's the majority of the territory of Mexico experiences heat, heat waves. So it's really getting higher and higher every day. We've been experiencing a lot of deaths, larger numbers than the year before. Extreme heat is a silent killer. 
uh, is one of the effects of climate change that kills more people, more than hero gains, more than any other effect, and is preventable. So for folks here in this neighborhood, there's no relief outside, and then they go inside and there's still no relief from the heat. How does extreme heat impact different classes here in Mexico? In Mexico, what is happening is that if you see in an aerial photograph or an aerial view, you see that there are certain areas that has a lot of trees, that has a lot of parks, and this is usually where more well-off socioeconomic people live. And then when you are kind of like going to the peripheries, you can see that there is less and less vegetation. They are at home in a hot environment. They go out, they walk under the sun without the shade. There is no, not a break for them with the, with the extreme heat. As Mexico deals with deadly heat waves, we spoke with leading atmospheric scientist Gras Galarraga about whether experimenting with Earth's atmosphere is a potential solution or Pandora's box. We have seen elevated temperatures in many countries that are developing countries, and we know that that creates problems for large numbers of populations that don't have the means to protect themselves. And that's, as a human being, it concerns me, not only as a scientist. Are there any climate intervention measures that have stuck out to you as, you know, promising? I, I suppose you mean geoengineering, right? Yes. Uh, well, as a cloud physicist, we have known for decades, in the 70s actually, that humans can change the nature of how the cloud fields over the oceans reflect the sunlight. Globally, you, you decrease the average temperature, but what does it do regionally to, um, you know, in some areas will get more sun sunlight and some less, and the, the patterns of precipitation will change. Raga is talking about one often cited concern around solar geoengineering, that blocking the sun in one nation to curb deadly heat waves could have unintended effects in neighboring nations throwing off the ecosystem and leading to either intense flooding or severe drought. So if that were to change, who would be benefited and who would be affected negatively? So, so that's very serious, no? Because obviously we know as in, in, in developing countries and um, low-income countries, they have very little say in the uh, international fora, right? Addressing inequality, poverty. And so uh, who's going to look out for them when the, some nations decide to do it? So uh, in that sense, um, I mean, I personally am not for implementing them, but I do think that we need to know what could happen. Former Canadian Prime Minister Kim Campbell is part of the Climate Overshoot Commission. We don't have any global governance structure to manage this. The governance of solar geoengineering is the big, you know, 800 pound gorilla in the room. Because the world has not created or empowered any global organization to take on this issue, to take on the issue of managing the research, evaluating the research, and helping to develop a global consensus on what to do or not to do with it. And the problem is that there may be some countries that, that want to try it and go it alone, but, and, and could impose significant uh, negative effects on other countries. We don't know yet. Even if governments do find a way to coordinate on solar geoengineering, there's little to stop private citizens from trying to take matters into their own hands. In late 2022, a US-based company called Make Sunsets conducted its own experiment in Mexico, releasing small amounts of sulfur dioxide into the skies above Baja, California, to demonstrate how solar geoengineering could be done by private companies. They did this without permission from Mexico's government. And just a few weeks later, Mexico became the first nation in the world to ban solar geoengineering experiments. 
The move draws a hard line against the technology that the U.S. government next door has been pouring millions of dollars of research into. Make Sunsets declined to speak with us on camera, but told us their experiment in Mexico had released less sulfur dioxide than a single 747 plane releases in one hour, and that until Mexico is ready to work with them, they're focused on the U.S. At the tail end of a summer that has seen heat wave after heat wave, I went to Mexico City to hear directly from Mexico's top environmental officials about their concerns around solar geoengineering and what they see as a path forward in protecting against extreme heat. Nosotros enfáticamente decimos ahorita la bioingeniería en México no. Vino una empresa de Estados Unidos a experimentar a nuestro país sin contar con los permisos ambientales correspondientes ni del gobierno federal, ni del gobierno estatal, ni del gobierno municipal. Dándose a conocer como la primera empresa en el mundo que está haciendo este tipo de experimentos eh, y sin medir claramente lo que son las consecuencias. For the Mexican government, Make Sunset's experiment was a stunt that crossed the line it not only violated Mexican law, but completely disregarded concerns the Mexican government has about solar geoengineering and its potential impact on the planet. What is it about solar geoengineering that concerns Mexico? To con ello tenemos una posición como gobierno de México también muy clara en el sentido de que no podemos estar construyendo falsas salidas al cambio climático. Lo que hay que reducir urgentemente son las emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero. Entonces, no se trata de generar una, fa una salida falsa al cambio, al cambio climático, sino atacar las causas que finalmente están ocasionando ese cambio climático. Like many governments feeling the brunt of Earth's warming climate, Mexico's leadership says the greatest tool for stopping climate change is international collaboration. How important is communication between countries when it comes to exploring climate intervention measures? Creemos mucho del compromiso de estas relaciones que podemos tener armónicamente con otras naciones para enfocar el cuidado de la casa común. La casa común es el planeta Tierra y tenemos una responsabilidad todos los países. Next on In Real Life, Mexico, Canada, and the United States show what the future of international cooperation could look like in the fight against climate impacts. It's a real grind, and it takes a special kind of person to continuously do it. Uh, safety message of the day, smoke inhalation. A lot of areas that we're working in, we're seeing again with the- Back in Canada, local firefighters team up with crews from around the world including the U.S. and Mexico. It's an example of the international coordination Mexico's government wants in the fight against climate impacts. Simone Bermudez is a Spanish-speaking Canadian firefighter, working with Mexican crews here for a month-long deployment. Forest fires are the only natural disaster that we've convinced ourselves that we can control. Think about like tsunamis, earthquakes, uh, floods. Those are all just considered as part of our natural world. But somehow, um, when we talk about forest firefighters, forest firefighters and the jobs that they do, it becomes very measurable. As in, like this is a success or a failure. What's it like to have so many crews from different parts of the world coming in? It's a big deal, especially when the increase, it seems, every year of fires. It just feels like if it's not every year, it's every other year. You hear the words unprecedented, record-breaking, unheard of. It's a real grind, and it takes a special kind of person to continuously do it. For Simone and other firefighters across North America, fire season has become an almost continual battle to protect communities near and far. As the impacts of wildfires and extreme heat grow, the conversation around technological solutions has drawn more attention and more controversy. 
More than 400 scientists and academics have signed an open letter calling for a worldwide ban on solar geoengineering, arguing that without coordination between neighboring nations, it's impossible to fairly govern the use of sunblocking particles in our atmosphere. And while a growing body of research shows its positive potential, even its advocates say solar geoengineering alone won't heal our planet. It can't solve the problem and it will never get rid of the need to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. What can we do while we still have time to do it? And will something like solar geoengineering be a device that buys us time? Maybe, but that's the most it will do. The most it can do is buy us time.